Okay. Welcome everyone. This is Michael Hart. Thanks so much for joining us today for my webinar entitled Mapping to the Core Dyslexia, Mastering Phonological Processing and Rapid Automatic Naming with the CTOP and REN, RES test. Uh, got a great number of people signed up for this. I know uh, quite a few of you are going to need to to get the recording, so I want to make sure you understand that it is being recorded today. And I also made the effort to get the slides out to you before uh, the I started tonight. And hopefully you'll have those available to you, and if you wanted to print those out, then have something to kind of scratch notes on as we go. Also remember that um, if you miss anything, you can always ping me at my email address, which is Dr. D O C T O R Michael. Hart, H-A-R-T, at Gmail. Tonight, my producer was called away at the last minute. So we're going we're gonna to see if we can swing it here. I'm going to make the presentation for probably about 45 minutes, and then I will um, check the chat box and make sure that uh, if there's an opportunity for me to ask questions or answer questions uh, tonight, I can do that. But again, uh, remember that you can always ping me and the key thing is I want to make sure you know that you are not going to be left hanging. I want to make sure you get cared for. So let's get started. Um, I always like to begin with a roadmap as many of you know. So now we're going to talk about the, the two literally the most widely used tests in the United States at least for rapid automatic naming. Now, within that context, we're going to talk about the CTOP in general. I think most of you are probably pretty uh, aware and adept, and this may be some review, but if you're new to it, we're going to talk about what it is and what it measures, and then a bit about how to interpret the scores. Now, we're going to, then we're going to drill into this whole uh, rapid automatic naming, rapid alternative uh, stimulus test that was created uh, Frankly, the first version came out in the 70s, and then Marianne Wolf uh, improved upon it in uh, 2005. So we're going to talk about that a lot and how that actually leads us to a much deeper level of understanding of how we need to treat dyslexia these days. It's really, uh, just as I mentioned in my uh, comments with regard to the marketing of this whole thing, it's, these are two... Incredibly simple but incredibly powerful tests, and uh, it behooves us to know about these in depth and make sure that we include them in our evaluations and include them in uh, our requests for parents who are on this call as well, because I think I probably have parents and specialists and uh, some educators on the call at the same time, so we're going to try to cover all those bases. And then a little bit of neuroscience, not going to drill too deep, but I want to talk about how what we know about the brain and how students' brains are wired uh, can increasingly allow us to be much more specific with regard to mapping our remediation plans. So again, uh, those of you who know me know that I have a really kind of a really key philosophical uh, driver or or belief, and that is that when we as specialists or educators do an evaluation, um, a lot of times there's a, a lot of focus around the kind of broader based scores and what the diagnosis is and whether that uh, particular child meets the criteria for them to be eligible for special ed services. Now, I understand the importance of that and it is critical. I know that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of passion around that issue. Um, and, not but, and I want to talk about the importance of understanding that test results can also be used as a part of our observations because the more specific we are in our observations and our discussion of what we're seeing in the test results at a granular level, the easier it is for us to draw a direct line between what we're seeing in the testing and what we want to do in terms of remediation in the classroom, uh, at home, with the tutor, wherever this child receives support for the development of the literacy skills. Now, I think it also provides us with the opportunity to create a common language 
And with that common language, oftentimes comes the increased probability that we can collaborate with each other as a village, as a team. And those of you who know me realize or understand that I use that term village uh, quite frequently because I think it's really relevant and important. Now, a goal also kind of underlying this whole discussion tonight is this concept of the double deficit hypothesis. I would suspect that probably all of, if not all of you, are aware of this. And this is all about our more recent understanding that dyslexia is multidimensional. And we've done an incredible job over the last, uh, gosh, de few decades with regard to identifying phonological processing and the impact that that has on our children's ability at the most basic level of decoding and the development of cyber vocabulary and things like that. Um, and it, it was, again, really wrapped up in that whole historical battle around whether this uh, issue of dyslexia was a language processing issue or a visual issue. And I think that we put that, 98% of that, we put that to bed here and elsewhere in the world. But there are still parts of the world where that's still a raging argument. And so uh, I think that once the new information about neuroscience spreads out across the world, we're going to have a um, uh, less of an issue with that. So Marianne Wolf, again, I'm going to talk about Marianne a lot tonight. I've been reading her, studying her a lot, so um, I'm going to reference her a lot. So she was the person with I think it was Elizabeth Norton, Norton that came up with this concept of the double deficit hypothesis. And she really talks about it in terms of this is where we're at now. And that's why the value of the CTOP and the rapid, auto, rapid automatic naming testing is so incredibly important because while we're clear and we've got hundreds of studies about phonological processing, we've got several different approaches to remediation. The, Horton Gillingham being the gold standard, of course, we now know that there really actually is a complex circuit of linguistic or language and cognitive processes that go beyond phonology that ultimately impact um, fluency and comprehension. I'm going to try to get to the core of that tonight and explain that in a way that makes sense so that we have a broader lens through which we can look at our kids and figure out what all we need to do in terms of understanding how their brains are wired. Now, the critical variable here is that, you know, we've been able to talk about it on a rational basis for a while now, but most recently, in just the last few years, we've had very good success with functional MRIs, functional magnet magnetic resonance imaging, where we're able to do studies where We've got a person, just a young student or an older student, in a MRI machine, and they're able to uh, replicate the reading process. And we're able to literally, in real time, map the kinds of activity going on in various neural pathways. So what we've understood is this. we got clear understanding of what's happening from a phonological processing level between readers and non-readers, or readers and people who have difficulty with reading. And now, just now, we're starting to get some decent research that shows that there are actually different neural pathways that can be identified that are involved in the process of rapid automatic naming. And when I say rapid automatic naming, I mean that kind of a, just a little, it's like a little tip of the iceberg that I'm going to talk about in a little while. So what does that mean? What that means is that different neural pathways are going to mean different intervention approaches are needed that go beyond phonological deficit remediation. Now, to me, that makes so much sense because I know, I bet every single person listening and every single person who's going to hear the recording has a case or many cases where um, someone was identified, a young child was identified, and a particular Orton-Gillingham approach was applied. You know, it could have been, uh, there's a whole bunch of them. I'm not going to name any of them, but um, there's this, uh, what happened was that, you know, it takes so long for the child to be identified. It takes so long for the child to be tested. It takes so long to figure out, okay, this is what's going on with them. It's a phonological issue. And then the remediation is put in place, but there's whole big chunks that are not working 
for the child. And it was very frustrating, obviously, for everybody involved, quite frankly, but somehow we're missing a piece. So I think that what we're learning now is that we found a missing piece and that we can't just focus on phonological. We need to focus on the other underlying uh, cognitive processes that are going beyond that that are having a direct impact on specifically fluency and then ultimately the goal of reading, of course, which is comprehension. So we're going to find, I think, as the research continues, that we're going to be able to flesh out our model. Uh, but for right now, um, Marianne and her cohorts are uh, using this frame of double deficit hypothesis because there are kids who have just phonological issues, there are kids who have just rapid automatic naming, and then the kids who have what we call the double deficit have both. And those are the ones that struggle the most. So it behooves us to understand what's happening in both of those cognitive areas. <laughs> those of you who've listened to me before, you've seen this, and I, I just love it, so I'm going to keep using it. This is the this is the little piece of paper that I scratch out for parents when I used to do evaluations, and it was really about explain to them what the four most critical components are of a psychoeducational evaluation. So what we have at the top here, these circles, is really representative of the, the narrative that we want to create, the observational information that we collect, whether it's from a checklist or whether it's from an interview. And here it's so super critical because what we want to do is make sure that we create a narrative that talks about the whole person. And again, it's another opportunity for us not to over-organize around what the child's test scores are, but the secret sauce here is there are ways in which we understand this little guy or this little gal as a person, and that's going to drive the creativity and the art that we use with our actual remediation. Then, of course, the second component is IQ testing. The third component is academic achievement. And uh, you'll see at the bottom of, this, of the uh, slide that I've included a link here that has, uh, I found it online, and it has a wonderful list of uh, lots and lots of different tests that can be used for measuring different types of uh, uh, academic issues and cognitive processing. So that's going to be something that you'll want to keep in your, uh, I actually passed this out last time, but I know many of you weren't at my last webinar, so I wanted to make sure that everybody got it again. And of course, what we missed for years and years and years was the cognitive and the language processing testing that was necessary for us to be able to speak explicitly about where the child's strengths and weaknesses were cognitively in terms of how their brain was wired. I know from my own training, in the very beginning of my training, we missed this completely. And the discrepancy model in the schools was all about you know, looking at the WIS scores and then looking at the Woodcock-Johnson and completely missing the fact that, you know, if we don't test for something, we're not going to see it. And if we don't see it, there's nothing, we don't know what to do about it. So really, this is where the CTOP and the Rapid Optimum Test kind of lands. By no means are they the only test in this area, as you'll see from the PDF, but <clears throat> clearly it behooves us because they are so simple to give and they're so useful in their information that any of us who do evals or any parent who is requesting specific tests for their child needs to make sure that these two tests are in included in an eval. <clears throat> and I want to point out here, they're, they're both um, quite inexpensive, so they're not a huge uh, uh, financial burden to include in your uh, group of tests. So let's take a quick look at the CTOP. Now, we're, of course, we're talking about the CTOP 2, um, and it was uh, renormed pretty recently. And uh, in fact, I'll tell you now that at the end of the slides, there's an addendum of, I think, about four slides where I go into a much uh, more detailed explanation of what the top six subtests are and what they measure. And I didn't think that it was an effective use of your time for me to kind of go through that with you. Because many of you, of course, it's going to be a review. And those of you who are new, it's very simple for you to be able to read that and get an understanding of, of what those subtests are. So in general, you know, 
we're talking about a, a test that covers a lot of wildfire. Um, you know, ages four years to zero months through the 24th year and 11 months. It's uh, relative to a lot of tests that could be given in an eval. 30 to 40 minutes is pretty fantastic considering the amount of information that you're able to derive. And it's, of course, given individually. And it's really, quite frankly, it's only been around for a little over 15 years. So we've known about phonological processing issues for many, many decades. But this is uh, a beautifully constructed test that we've had available to us now for quite some time. And um, it behooves us to make sure that we're, it's in our quiver. Um, so again, you, you, there's going to be a lot of ancillary data at the end. But, you know, of course, the CTOP has four principal uses, identifying kids in the first place, uh, taking a look at the uh, profile of strengths and weaknesses, uh, among those different phonological processes that it measures. And it's a great pre and post test to give to get a sense for a child's progress. And of course, you know, it's a very strong measure that can be used in, in research. So this is really just a, a slide for you to kind of do a, a quick and dirty download of what it is all about. Now, uh, all things being equal, when I talked about composite scores at the beginning of this, I, I talked about how we have to be careful and not over-organize around them, but the test is the CTOP has six core subtests and six alternative subtests or supplemental subtests. The six core subtests are organized into three what they call composite scores. And this is research-based. Uh, so there's a kind of a general sense of a composite score for phonological awareness, which is predicated on two subtests, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Phonological memory, of course, memory being this huge issue, and that's predicated on two subtests here on the CTOP, and then, of course, rapid automatic naming, which is represented here by two subtests, and then there are supplementary tests as well. Now, a couple things I will say here. One, um, this has very good reliability and validity. And I know that, well, shoot, there's only two subtests for each of these. This does not mean that you're not going to do other testing. Obviously, the Woodcock Johnson's going to flesh out your word attack skills and letter word identification. And there's other uh, language-based tests that you can give to really suss out their phonological processing. But the quick and dirty, this is a beautiful, beautiful test. And um, uh, even as simple as it is, I, I just can't speak highly enough about it. So here are the three main, and just for the, the new people that may uh, just be getting into tests, the, the concept here is that the elision and the blending word subtests are statistically combined to create a composite score. So they're going to be combined to create the phonological awareness composite score. And the memory for digits and non-word repetition are going to be combined statistically to create the phonological memory score and so forth. Now, uh, the research shows that elision, the elision score is a super strong predictor with regard to uh, expecting reading problems uh, later on. So um, it's important to, again, there's another kind of an important piece to this now. Now, what I want to, what I want to mention here at this point is that the tests here are really a reflection of a certain camp of people who believe that rapid automatic naming should be considered under the rubric, the, the general umbrella of phonological processing. Now, more recently, I think some other, another group would make the pretty cogent argument that because of what we're seeing in the, the functional MRIs, that rapid automatic naming is really something in and of itself by virtue of the fact that it's uh, we're seeing different neural pathways involved in issues with that particular skill. So again, from a historical perspective, what, what happened was we uh, first did what they call the correlation study. And of course, all of you specialists know and all the, the educators know what a correlation. But for those of you who don't, think about it in terms of co-relation. Co or how, how are they related to each other? Phonological awareness composite score, phonological memory composite score have very high relatedness scores statistically. Not so with rapid naming. 
So then the next level of analysis was, well, let's do this more sophisticated statistical analysis, this multiple regression. And again, they found the same thing, that uh, phonological awareness and phonological memory kind of clustered together, whereas rapid automatic naming or rapid naming was actually uh, what, they, what they say is, is that it accounted for less variance than one would expect for uh, a test that's supposedly under this umbrella. And then finally, most recently, because we've been able to look at the brain and measure actual neural activity, we know that there's clearly different pathways. And so therefore, it's valuable to give those tests on the CTOP, but you also have to remember that it's assumed that uh, it's under phonological awareness and it's actually considered now most recently to not be. However, again, if you go back to the observational level, it's just going to give you another couple of subtests, actually more than that, to, to, to be able to really observe the child's behavior and get a sense for specifically what really seems to be hanging them up. Because that's what's going to help you build your goals for the IEP or the 504 or for the tutoring or whatever you're doing at home. So here's the list of supplementary subtests, and there's a reason why I would include them, and that is because uh, they're quick and easy to give. And if you look at the challenges, the blending and segmenting, this time non-words, and we're talking about segmenting actual words, and then we're talking about phoneme reversal. These are all issues that we need to deal with with regard to phonological processing for these kids. So the beauty of giving these tests is that it's just more ammo. It's just more uh, information for us to really drill down and get granular with regard to where the kids' issues are. Because when you've got these really powerful Orton-Gillingham-based uh, remediation approaches, it's a lot easier to kind of draw lines between the two when you've got this kind of granularity in your test results. Whereas if you just stayed at the composite level, it just kind of leaves you hanging. It leaves teachers hanging a lot, and it leaves parents hanging a lot, and it robs us of the opportunity again to have that development of the, of the common language and that opportunity for us to to really have use that common language to, so that we can collaborate with each other and and create trust in our relationship, uh, which is of course you know this is a very heavily emotionally laden issue, and we need to uh, address that. And either side going scorched earth is ultimately uh, not the most effective path to go. Now I also like to make note of the. Uh, issue with what the quote-unquote jagged profiles. At the bottom of the slide, you'll see that I've included a link for a TEDx talk. I bet that a good chunk of you have already listened to this. And if you haven't, I really strongly urge you to do so. It's a beautiful, beautiful presentation. Starts out a little slow, but Todd Rose is a Harvard professor who uh, actually dropped out of high school, and he tells his story within the context of this whole uh, myth of average. So one of the things I like to point out to people who haven't given this test a lot yet is this really beautiful example of how you can get over-organized around the composite score and totally miss what's going on. So here's a phonological awareness composite score. Okay, Let me just check here for a second. Everybody seems to be okay. Um, if you were to just look at the composite score, it's a scaled score of 85. Now, you may remember from your testing world that on this test, the mean or the average score is 100. So 85 represents 15 points below that average score or the 50th percentile. And that corresponds to a percentile ranking of 16, which means that put 100 kids up against the wall, they'll do, your child or that child will do as well as your 16. So that really, uh, you know, that's a red flag. However, when you drill down to the, uh, yeah, when you drill down to the specific scores that were combined to create that composite score, you're rendering the composite score meaningless because if you look at this, the blending words, the child is actually 
in this particular standard score, 10 is the mean. 10 is average. And that means that it's right there at the 50th percentile. However, let me tell you about a lesion. A lesion has to do, I don't know where that word came from, but it has to do with this kind of a task where the examiner would say, say popcorn. I think a child would say popcorn. And then say, okay, now say popcorn without the pop. And it requires the child to understand on a uh, phonological level or a decoding level how those two, how those letters and those sub groupings of letters are separated. And clearly this little guy or this little girl is struggling dramatically because they're at the, they've got a standard score of five, which represents the fifth percentile. So they're way, way struggling in this area. So what do we learn from this? Well, clearly they may have gotten some tutoring already where they worked on specifically blending words. And that's important information, which should be in the narrative. Or maybe that's just how they're wired. But we know for sure that the goals in the IP or any anywhere, you know, the, the tutoring or whatever absolutely needs to include specific remediation in, in the area of segmenting words. Okay? I think for many of you that's just a review, but I, if anybody's new and they don't understand that, because I see that a lot with parents who are trying to make sense of this 25 or 30 page report where they're just just not enough narrative and there's not enough uh, information for them to make heads or tails, much less figure out what a lesion is. Okay, so there, there's your kind of uh, overview of the CTOP. Uh, you know, it's such a simple test to give. I think many of you have probably already given it, but I wanted to give you that extra added information with regard to what the research is saying now and where its value lies in terms of creating remediation plans versus getting over-organized around just getting the test done and getting those composite scores. So let's talk about the rapid, automated name, automat, uh, rapid automatized naming and rapid alternating stimulus tests. And again, as I mentioned, the first edition literally came out in 1976. I got to work with Martha Dinkla at uh, Hopkins in the uh, mid, uh, early mid-90s and um, and even then, I mean, most people just didn't didn't get it. So that was my, I was very very fortunate. And then Mary Ann Wolf is a mentee of Dr. Denkla, and so Mary Ann was um, worked with her to develop the new version in 2005. Look at this thing now. Look at this. This is a test that covers a lot of waterfront as well. Uh, five years, zero months to 18 years, zero months, and you're going to capture a considerable amount of information in five to ten minutes. And like all the other kind of uh, educational psychological testing, you know, the raw scores are converted to standard scores, which then allows you to talk in terms of percentiles. Um, most people these days want to be very, very cautious about age and grade equivalents. There's inflation, I understand, so that uh, we really want to focus on what the standard scores are and what that means in terms of percentiles, which really helps us a lot anyway, because it's a simple way to discuss what's going on with a child. Now, at the bottom of the slide, you'll see this link that I uh, left for you that is written by Elizabeth Norton and Marianne Wolf, and it's specifically about this particular issue of rapid automatic naming and reading fluency. We're going to talk about reading fluency and reading comprehension a lot. Because when you look at this test, you go, what the heck does this have to do with fluency and comprehension? So this is a great, great article about the implications for understanding and treatment of reading issues. And it is an academic article, but I will tell you that it is eminently uh, readable by uh, parents, specialists, and educators. There might be a couple of sections where there's a little bit too much drill down into the neuroscience but or statistics, but for the most part, it is an incredibly useful document that, I mean, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've I've used it as reference, and I've read it over and over and over, and it's just been really super helpful for me in terms of building out my template and building out my language. So when I talk about this, I can do it in a way that makes sense, and it's and it's approachable. It's not this really high-level ivory tower scientific stuff that just everybody kind of glazes over. 
So what does it, what, what's it look like? Uh, I'm going to show you in a second. But they're basically a bunch of, of rapid tests with letters, numbers, objects, colors, and then this rapid alter, alternating stimulus test that Marianne uh, Wolf created that has these uh, uh, tests where there's both letters and numbers or numbers and colors. And um, really, the scoring is based on the amount of time that it takes a person to uh, finish the test. So it's it's mega simple, but uh, just a quick word on this whole rapid alternating stimulus test. I frankly I don't see it a lot in the write-ups. Um, hope thankfully I see more and more of the write-up with regard to rapid automatic naming. Although we are still many 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 of us need to make sure that we start in including this. But this test, uh, this portion of the test, actually, as you can tell, uh, is about switching your attention. You know, it's, an, it's kind of an executive functioning issue where very, very rapidly you've got to switch your attention and disengage from trying to pull up your memory of what that letter is or pull up your memory of what that color is and then you have to switch back and forth. So it certainly provides uh, lots of uh, extra data, but for the most part I'm seeing uh, most clinicians focus on the rapid automatic naming. Now, some of you out there may tell me that I'm wrong, but um, that's uh, that's just what I'm seeing right now, and I think that's going to change over time. But I wanted to make note of that because the test is called you know, RAN slash RAS. So this is super super crazy simple. You know, it, it, you know, each one student at a time. You explain what the task is. You know, you tell them you're going to name each item, whatever it's color, shape, number, whatever, and they have to do it as fast as they can. And when you clear that the student understands the instructions, you're going to give them a five-second warning, get them ready to go, five, four, three, two, one, go. And then you start timing when the student gives their first answer, and you keep going until the student finishes the sheet. Now, when I talk about a sheet, I'm going to show you what that looks like. Now, I don't – that this came – I this is a screenshot directly from that article that I referenced a couple minutes ago by Norton and Wolf, so I don't feel like I'm violating any kind of ethical standards. Uh, as a psychologist, I have to be super careful about not publishing um, data from tests that aren't in the public domain. And uh, since this came directly from Norton and Wolf, I feel like it's okay to do it. I just want to give you a sense. People that haven't given you this test, it's so disarmingly simple that it's like, uh, how can you extrapolate? But you'll find that on a statistical basis, it's a very, very strong predictor. And it basically reflects... Uh, you know, something that much, much more complex and deeper cognitive processing issues. Here's a template example for you. We don't need to spend a lot of time on this, although you'll notice it's kind of backwards, actually. And the standard scores for this poor child, I mean, they're really struggling with all the different aspects of rapid naming. And so their descriptive rating, their, their, their range is poor across the board. Now, I don't have any other templates right now, but the templates you'll see may very well be very different for objects, colors, numbers, and letters. And there could be a great more variability, which is going to then drive your thinking about where the key issues are. For this young person, or for this person, because they're in their eight-year uh, range, they really struggle across the board. So this really kind of brings me to this point. We have been really clear for many years now that if we recognize phonological processing early on in the game, that early intervention is clearly the way to go. And there's far too much uh, wait and see still going on. And then there's the whole issue with RTI, which I'm not going to get into. Um, but clearly, we've been much more mobilized and much more uh, adept at integrating early intervention of the Orton-Gillingham type for phonological press processing remediation. What this tells us is that it's no different for rapid automatic naming. In fact, Dr. Wolf talks about um, the use of colors and rapid automatic naming of colors for kids as young as three, where that is a significant predictor for when they get older and they have, uh, they're being exposed to letters and they're being exposed to the whole sound symbol relationship, 
that it's there's a very good prediction that they're going to have issues with rapid automatic naming with letters. So it behooves us to not only think about early intervention for phonological processing, but for rapid automatic naming as well. And I use that term, but you're going to see that there's all these other processes that we need to approach. Now, that's a big that's a big ask, um, but I think because Part of the power of this is that it's so simple to get this information. It doesn't make sense not to. It's got to be a part of our total picture. So um, we have to, as clinicians, and we have to, as parents and educators, move towards this idea of having that conversation as early as possible. Because, again, remember, you know, there's the kids that have both. There's the kids that really struggle with phonology, and then there's the kids that struggle with rapid automatic naming. And the kids who don't struggle with phonology, but they have problems with rapid automatic naming, are going to be very confusing to uh, people who work with them. Because it's like, well, wait a minute, we check phonology, and they seem to be pretty aware. They seem to be doing okay. So why are they struggling so intensely with, um, with uh, fluency and comprehension? So I'll tell you why. The, the, the weird, the crazy thing about the, the REN test is that it's incredibly simple, but it's a pointer, so to speak. It's a predictor of areas of weakness at much deeper levels across several different areas of cognitive processing that ultimately impact fluency. And then, of course, if it impacts fluency, remember me talking about my bucket of energy. If the child is spending a considerable amount of their energy with decoding and the phonological awareness and the decoding, then they're not going to have much energy left to be able to work on their fluency and their comprehension. But the kids who have intact decoding skills, who have issues with rapid automatic naming, are going to now be spending all their energy on the fluency component, which is going to impede their ability to expend the majority of their energy on the comprehension. And without comprehension, what do you have? It doesn't make sense. It becomes this empty thing. So now we're challenged. We have to move beyond this focus on automaticity, of course, right, with word recognition, the phonological piece, the phonemic piece, the, gram the uh, gramming piece, the, the decoding and the development of site vocabulary and those familiar words that they become automatic with, to thinking more about how different parts of the brain, we need to work on helping kids develop connectivity in their brain between not just the components in their brain that have to do with phonology, but also orthography, morphology, syntax, and semantics. Now, uh, for those of you who roll your eyes at those, those, let's just get this definition thing out of the way. Super simple. Orthography, when you think about orthography, just think about the rules for spelling in English for a particular language. or uh, So think rules for spelling. Think about how important it is to teach that child rules for spelling over and over and over until these pathways are developing in their brain that allows them to create more automaticity with regard to that component. Morphology is nothing more than you know how words are structured to create or change meaning. So it's, that has to do with prefixes and suffixes and so forth, and what, how the word changes when you attach those to a root word. And my favorite example is <laughs> so clearly the difference between husband and when you put a prefix of X on there, that clearly creates a different meaning, okay? Husband, ex-husband, two very different things. So again, morphology is nothing more than that. It's just, you know, just structure how to create and change meaning by adding and subtracting chunks of the word. Syntax is nothing more than how words and phrases are put together so they make sense. And semantic knowledge, of course, semantics is meaning. So it's not just meaning of a word, but it's also meaning of a phrase. And as they develop and become you know, older and they're more sophisticated, then it's all about kind of that subtlety and nuance of what a chunk of text means and how each word is informed by other words in that chunk of text. 
So that's a tall order. That's a tall order. And I think you could say that, of course, any child going through the school system needs to learn these things. But, of course, the same thing with phonology. Some kids, it, come, it just kind of almost comes automatically. I've got to be careful about that because, of course, we know that um, our brains aren't wired to read naturally. Our brains are wired to understand language, but they're not wired to read. So we have to create those connections. And so, you know, all this focus for the last few decades has been on phonology. Now we want to move towards creating more complexity in the model. It just doesn't mean that we can't do it. It just means that we have to be aware and we have to support our educators and our tutors so that they get the support and the education they need in order for them to be able to integrate this into their work. So it looks like this. Um, well, how do you do that? So I'm going to talk about in terms of this uh, program that Dr. Wolf created called RAVO. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. There are some pluses and minuses to it. It kind of, for me, it serves as a, a model for us because it only goes up through elementary school. And it's all about anchoring kids to certain core words in their language, in their whatever their language is. So, for instance, we'll just use English. And so the certain core words that kids need to know in first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, right? We create, and she's created this product so that it allows you to kind of like cut to the chase with that. But then it also provides you with specific ways in the classroom, at home, and with tutors where you can integrate their, not only their awareness of phonology, but integrate the spelling rules in orthography or integrate how words get broken apart for morphology and how to put words together to make a meaningful sentence and what, what, you know, what words mean and what sentences mean and what, what paragraphs mean. Now, again, it's, a, it's kind of on a process level. It's similar to what we're doing in phonology, but we're doing it now with several different other cognitive processes. And it's not the end of the world. It's doable. And in fact, the Ravo is probably one of the few products out there, and it has been uh, assessed. It has been researched. What am I thinking of? The right word is there have been projects or uh, scientific studies that have provided uh, some. Ra uh, gosh, I'm sorry. There have been some some projects and some scientific studies that have verified that this is a uh, significantly useful program and it adds value for the kids in terms of creating improvement. And the link at the bottom is specifically an article about uh, what it is, what the thinking is behind it, the neuroscience, and then how to take that information with what we know now about how a child's brain is wired and put it into the classroom. So what does that mean? Uh, that means that we've got a lot of work to do. Um, I know that there's been some studies where people thought that, well, if it's a new issue of fluency, then what we'll do is we'll get this chunk of reading and we'll have the child repeat it and repeat it and repeat it until they increase their speed and they become more fluent. However, the research is pretty clear that that ends up being somewhat empty because we're not helping the child <clears throat> on the comprehension side of the, the uh, equation. So we have to be careful to understand that not repeated reading with increased speed is not enough. We have to engage. We have to connect all those other levels of cognitive language processing. So fluency and comprehension also depend on that automaticity that you see when we're working with kids with the multisensory model for uh, phonology and phonological awareness and, and developing their decoding skills. So on a process level, it's the same. It's just that we're getting to a more complex level. So we're thinking now from beyond just subword and words to actual connected text. Now, of course, the question is, well, you know, now we've been through all this. I mean, tell me what I can do. Where's the answer? And i got to tell you that there, beyond Ravo, there's few integrated commercial products. Uh, and again, the problem is that Ravo is actually built for small classroom groups. However, I think the model can be converted to concept of small groups with a tutor who has the proper training. Um, and I quite frankly think that, and this is my own opinion, 
I don't know what Dr. Wolf would say about this, but the idea is that there is an incredible dearth of good tutors out there. And one of the issues is expense. And I think that if there is a way to take this model and integrate it with a small group, we could bring down the expense for tutor for kids to get tutored because they can kind of use this model and uh, and uh, integrate it with uh, whatever it is you're doing with the phonology. And the problem with the Rainbow is it ages out after elementary school. I know they're working on that, but uh, it leaves us hanging because we so few of us have been paying attention to rapid automatic naming in the earlier grades that we oftentimes don't find out about it until middle school and high school. And then it's like, well, what do we do? So I've been searching and searching, and I think this is going to be an ongoing conversation with us. But uh, my colleague and partner, Marissa Bernard at the OG Online Academy, is working diligently on an advanced comprehension remediation course that should be due out this summer. And uh, I will make sure that all of you on my email list are aware of when this comes out. Now, Marissa, the beauty of Marissa is that she's an incredibly gifted person who works super, super hard. So even though her grounding is in Orton-Gillingham, she's well aware of this dynamic, and she's going to be able to kind of create something that we can hold on to so that we can go beyond uh, just the basics of OG and get into more kinds of things that we've been talking about here today to integrate all these other cognitive processes so that we're really kind of focused on giving the kids what they need. Now I'm getting pretty close down. It's about 5:48 now. So I want to point these out. Uh, I've always I always like to leave a couple of pages worth of resources. These are just a listing of some of the ones that I've noted already. The first one is the uh, Norton and Wolf article. The second one is about the uh, neuroscience behind Rago and how they integrated it in the classroom. That's a very, very important uh, article to read because I think there's uh, ways where for older kids we can replicate that in our own practices uh, with not, a, not with no small amount of work. Um, the next link has comes from University of Michigan. I would suspect that many of you know that University of Michigan has a wonderful dyslexia help section where they have tons and tons of great content for people. And I happen to just pull this article on morphology and how to, uh, some of the strategies you can use to help work with kids in terms of, uh, you know, chunking out how the words come together for me. Children of the Code interview with the Dr. Wolf is really just this really fantastic interview that was in depth. I think if, I think many of you may have read that already, but it's wonderful to have. If you have it, please do read it. It'll teach you a great deal. Uh, I'm going, to, I'm going to come back to the next one, but the list of psychological and educational tests is uh, the one that I mentioned earlier. There's another uh, University of Michigan um, article about word retrieval and rapid automatic naming. I think the more you can read, the better. And then finally, I wanted to mention this intensive phonological awareness program. Now, I know it's not uh, touching on RAVO, but... Um, I just saw this professor at Vanderbilt, her name is Melanie Schul, and she has created this very intensive program that is integrated into the classrooms, and she piloted the program in West Virginia. And she did, I think her pilot was like nine or 12 schools, something like that, and she showed such great results that they are now implementing it statewide. So those of you who are out there who are looking for a comprehensive evidence-based program that we can use that not only integrates in the classroom, but she, she talks about integrating it with Tier 1 and Tier 2 of RTI. I, I just felt it was necessary to get that word out. And you'll be hearing more from me about uh, this particular professor and uh, what her work is and uh, how that can be, again, we're not just, we're not separating, we're integrating. So uh, how that might be really useful to your school districts uh, and your states and how we might be able to really get the word out and, and, and spread the good cheer. So there we go. That's um, uh, quite a bit of information. Again, that's the reason why I give you the slides, and that's why we record it, and that's why I always uh, ask you, please feel free to contact me at that email address. 
uh, I really want to create a sense of community. I really want to be useful and of value to you as much as I possibly can. That's what I do. This is what I am. This is what I do. So um, I'm super grateful that you've joined the community, and I just want to give back and, um, and take care of you as best I can. And as I mentioned, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, these particular slides here in the very end or in the addendum that will give you much more specific information about the CTOP. Okay, well, so thank you very much. Let me open up here and see if there is a question. Let me see if I can get to it. I'm going to figure out how to make this uh, bigger. Please explain the difference between phonological memory and short-term memory. Okay, well, let me start with that. Um, they are intertwined. However, the data is suggesting, as I just read today, that they're certainly intertwined, but there is a specificity specific to phonological memory in terms of the neural pathways that separates it somewhat from short-term memory. Now, I will tell you that um, in my previous webinars I've talked about, and I'm going to do this again, I'm going to do a webinar for free that talks about working memory and processing speed. And I'm going to parse out all that stuff so that people can kind of finally walk away with a, some information that's going to help them make sense, because that is an incredibly maddening issue. And so, um, but we do know that, um, that there is some substrate at the brain processing level that is different for phonological than in general working memory. So I'm going to provide you with more information. And if you want to follow up with an email to me, I'll make sure that it gets to you specifically. OK, let me see. I thought the processing speed, as, a, as tested by the RAN, was a function of the brain that is essentially hardwired into the brain and does not respond to remediation intervention. This is true. It is useful to us clinicians and dyslexia therapists to test Ron to indicate speed at which we can introduce material and how many repetitions exposures are needed to reach a level of mastery. I think that's a great I think it's a great question. And I think the one thing I would say is that um, if you read the research um, when we intervene, I, I don't think that we can necessarily radically shift processing speed, okay? We can radically shift the cognitive processes that go into um, fluency and comprehension. That's been proven in the research, but you're absolutely right that processing speed is kind of a separate issue that's more global. And you're right, so it's essentially hardwired. So you're right, it, it, having that information, and that frankly, Part of that comes from the WISC, although there are some other tests that you can give. And that's a beautiful thing to have. You're, you're absolutely right. And that's the whole point of having a complete eval, because we need to make sure that we have that information, because that's going to drive the specificity with which we build goals and um, objectives for our kid. So that's a good. And, and please, again, write me specifically if you want more info. Please explain the difference between phonological memory and short-term memory. Okay, we did that. Uh, please explain how the REN on the CTOP is different from the REN uh, slash RES. Okay, so I mentioned that earlier. So this might have come up uh, before we got to that point. But the point is that um, from a philosophical level, there is a group of people who are researchers in the phonological area. And before we had access to the functional MRIs, there was an assumption made on a rational basis that rapid automatic naming should fall under the rubric of phonological processing. Since we've, and since we've done the statistical studies, the correlation studies, multiple regression, and now, most importantly, the brain uh, neural pathway studies, we were able to separate those out and say, look, it's beyond phonology. It really has to do with the integration and connectivity 
of all these other linguistic and cognitive processing uh, uh, components of our brain. Okay, now where can I get more information on understanding CTOP results? For example, I had a student who tested 50 percentile for all subtests except memory for digits. He had several dyslexic markers, however, I wasn't sure if just one deficit would warrant a, dys a dyslexic diagnosis. Hmm. That's a that's a great question as well. Um, the uh, if you own if you own the CTOP, uh, first of all, you can you can you can do a Google search. Obviously, is what I did. There's lots and lots of you have to ask the right questions to get the right information. But why don't you why don't you email me again and let me see if I've got some resources that I can just give you to save you the time. But it's I can walk you if in fact if you have a particular eval and the test scores are confusing for you, uh, send it to me and, and get permission from the parents. Send it to me and let you and I get on the phone and we'll talk about it because. Um, you want to make sure that um, uh, let's see where I'm going to get to that thing. I'm sorry, this is a very narrow window. I don't know how to make it change. Forgive me. Okay, 50 percentile for everything except memory for digits. Now again, we get into this whole area of uh, dyscalculia and how that interacts with dyslexia. I'm not an expert at dyscalculia, but I do have some information about that. So um, I wouldn't be shy. Here's the deal about a dyslexic diagnosis. That's where it's a question of whether you're trying to get clearance from a school district in order for the child to get an IEP versus being descriptive and evaluative in terms of what, or descriptive and narrative with regard to how you want to talk to the teachers or the tutor or the parents on a on a um, on a on a, a descriptive level. So, if you're trying to reach a certain criteria, it all depends on which school district you're in. And again, if we talk, we can talk about that. But if you're worried about just making the diagnosis or not making the diagnosis, to me, I would say describe the dyslexic markers and focus on those in the remediation. And don't worry about, you know, dyslexia, not dyslexia, because you probably, depending on the age of the child, depending on all the, the entire uh, scale of test scores, um, we may be able to make more definitive decisions. But I think it speaks to the complexity of the brain, right? Please explain the difference between phonological memory and short-term memory. Did that. Okay, I think we're there. You'll have to forgive me. I'm lost without my producer, but uh, again, you've got my email, so if I don't answer something, um, please feel free to contact me. Um, and if you, if I did answer and it wasn't satisfying, <laughs> satisfactory, contact me, because I, I won't give up until I give you what you need. So um, that's just, that's just, you know, as they say, that's how I roll. So uh, I think we're right there at um, an hour mark. So I want to thank you so much once again, and I wish you a wonderful afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, and uh, look forward to continuing our conversation just a little bit down the road. Okay, take care.